Now I have the honor of introducing our, our main event, our featured speaker for today. Um, for this lunch session, Rick Hess of the American Enterprise Institute is going to provide a history of schools, why they look the way they do, why they're not a great match for what kids and families need today, and how hybrid schools and micro schools are an important piece in helping us reimagine a system that meets the needs of our kids. Uh, Dr. Hess is a senior fellow and the director of education policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where he, do, where he works on K-12 and higher education issues. He is the author of Education Week's popular blog, Rick Hess Straight Up, is a regular contributor to Forbes and The Hill, and serves as an executive editor of Education Next. Dr. Hess started his career as a high school social studies teacher and has since taught at colleges including Rice, Harvard, Georgetown, and the University of Virginia. His books include Spinning Wheels, Letters to a Young Education Reformer, Cage Busting Leadership, and A Search for Common Ground. He holds an MA and a PhD in government and an MED in teaching and curriculum from Harvard University. Please help me welcome Rick Hess. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm already bored too, man. Uh, nothing, nothing like a uh, luncheon speaker. You're talking to people, you're engaging all day, and then somebody comes up and drones at you. So we'll see what we can do about it. Um, it's real, I mean, first off, let me say it's real nice to be here. Um, I reside in Washington, D.C. Um, I spend most of my time, you know, when I go into the city, uh, working in a five-story D.C. office building. And one of the things I've written about over the years is that education can largely be divided into, think, into talkers and doers. Uh, there's people who talk about schools and school change, and there's people who actually do it. And for those of you who haven't visited DC in the last couple of years, let me refresh you, DC is filled with talkers, not doers. <laughs> so the chance to be out here with folks who are actually figuring this out and doing this work with kids um, is for me a, a terrific treat. Uh, along those lines, let me just ask real quick, my friend Maddie Fennell, National Teacher of the Year years ago, has this thing she likes to do. She says, Rick, it's actually useful to know who the hell you're talking to when you're talking to people. So let me ask real quick, uh, those of you who actually work in or run uh, hybrid schools or micro schools, could you just stick a hand in the air so I can just get a sense? Uh, those of you who work in advocacy or accreditation or policy related to hybrid or micro? Let me see hands. Uh, those of you who've been totally ignored by me thus far? Okay, fair enough. Um, so that's you guys. Let me, I'll just tell you, let me, let, me, let me say just one thing about me, because there's first off this question of why the hell is a guy who works in a DC office building and doesn't do any of this uh, here talking to you guys? And let me just be real, real honest, I have, to, I have to preface almost every talk I give with this, because it's always true, is when it comes uh, to micro-schooling and hybrid schooling, it's a safe bet that I know less about the particulars than every other person in this room. Um, it's just the way it goes. I'm a generalist, and you guys actually are making this happen. Um, that's part of it. So why am I actually interested in this, and why do I think I have anything to add? Well, look, I, I, my... my one of the things I find is that most people who talk about school improvement tend to talk about it in sweeping terms. We talk about it's part of the pursuit of equity. It's part of fulfilling the American ideal. We need it for the economy. At every point in this, any parent you're talking to has mentally tried to figure out what's on TV tonight. Because these are a bunch of vague aspirational words that have very little to do with us trying to make sure that our kids are getting the schooling that they need. Me, I'm involved in school reform not for any of those big, well-meaning reasons. I wound up involved in education because I hated school as a kid. I spent K-6 mostly getting beat up. Um, I spent 7 to 12 mostly tuning out. I was like 500th in my high school class. I got into one college, thank God. And when I went there, uh, I, sophomore year, I, somebody turned me on to Kurt Vonnegut, and I skipped like two weeks of class just reading the Vonnegut oeuvre, and I was like, oh, this is what schooling's about. It's about interesting ideas and good writing and being able to talk about this stuff. And what struck me at that moment 
and has stayed with me my entire career as a substitute teacher in Waltham, Massachusetts, and a high school teacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and somebody who trained teachers, and somebody who's been a professor at a half dozen schools of education, and has been stuck at a DC think tank now, well, I shouldn't say stuck, has been blessed to hang out at a DC think tank now for 20 years, um, is how little the fact that most kids find schooling alien and uninteresting and boring, how little that has to do with most of our conversation about school improvement. Only two out of five high schoolers say they are at all engaged in schooling. Yet when we talk about high school reform, that's never front and center. We're talking about standards. We're talking about assessments. We're talking about career tracks. What families are talking about is their kids hate school, that they're bored, that they're bullied, that they feel ignored. Well, that would seem to be a fundamental problem. And it would seem to me that we would do well if most of our efforts at school improvement started from there. And they rarely do. And I think part of the problem here is education has a really weird challenge. In most walks of life, what you're dying for is to meet people who are passionate about what they do. You know, I always, every time I'm somewhere giving this talk, I always think, you know, I wish airline customer relations was filled with people who are more passionate about their work. It's just me. Education, we've got this weird opposite problem. Education tends to attract people who are passionate. We've got too much passion. Usually that's a good thing. But in education, it can work against us because when you're passionate, you tend to be very self-assured. You tend to think that what you've learned is right. And because you're passionate, you're in a hurry. So there's a sense of urgency. So education tends to be filled with urgent, self-assured people pushing things fast. And then other self-assured, urgent people push back. And we wind up in these culture wars and these big debates. And what we should be starting with is how do we create the kinds of learning environments to work for kids? And what we find, wind up talking about is whether we should teach uh, eight-year-olds about uh, gender unicorns. And Whatever side of this you're on, and I'm, I'm personally skeptical, whatever side you're on, it feels pretty far removed. <laughs> feels pretty far removed from what most teachers and most parents that I interact with are actually worried about. But in a polarized age, a distrustful age, when social media is out there, this stuff's out there, it feels like what everybody's talking about, we react, we react reflexively, and off we go. Part of the challenge, I think, and one of the things that excites me about stuff like hybrid schooling is it's a chance to go back to square one and talk about what, are we really, what really matters. What are we trying to do for kids? How do we create schools that work for children and families and not respond to whatever's out there? Trick is it's really hard to get your hands around that. Now, we do have a solution. School districts go through this exercise a lot. And their solution uh, is they get a line item of $400,000 to hire some sleazebag carpetbag or a consulting firm to come in, do some focus groups, write a 73-page document nobody reads, which gets turned into an eight-slide PowerPoint that nobody pays attention to, and then they hold a board retreat where they announce that they now have a new strategic plan, which nobody pays attention to. Now, unfortunately, my bosses won't give me 400,000 bucks, so I'm never able to take that avenue. So uh, it's one of the things that's long kind of us uh, I've struggled with is how do we get our hands around what we want to do, what our vision should be, in a way if we don't have 400 grand to burn on, you know, consultants. And for me, I think a really useful place to start is by going back to first principles. How did we get here? Why do schools look like they do? So let me hit you guys with four questions real quick. Um, sometimes when I do this, uh, some of you've uh, who've been with it, done this with me before, I'm sure have suffered through it. We'll do like a 10 minute quiz and blah, blah, blah. We'll skip that today because uh, of the format. But I want to do, I want to throw out four questions. I want you to just take a moment to either think about them or chat about them as a table. Please don't look up the answers. It's not that important. And, uh, just, and then, then we'll just talk a bit about why the, what the answers to these questions are and maybe why that matters a bit. First question. What year was the first law providing for public education in what's now the U.S. adopted? First question, the year of the first law providing for public education in the U.S. Second question, two centuries ago, in 1810, 
What percentage of teachers were women? Two centuries ago, in 1810, what percentage of teachers were women? Question three, in 1900, what percentage of high school students graduated? Excuse me, let me rephrase. What percentage of 18-year-olds graduated high school? In 1900, a century ago, what percentage of 18-year-olds graduated high school? And question four, in 1990, what percentage of schools were connected to the internet? In 1990, what percentage of K-12 schools were connected to the internet? Uh, we're going to take 60 seconds, just noodle on it or chat about it, and then we're going to go through the answers. So, you know, before we proceed, let me say, if any of you are work for consultants, big consulting firms, and I hurt your feelings, I apologize. Um, I, know, I, know, I know McKinsey, Parthenon types tend to have sensitive feelings. You know, the $300,000 paychecks only go so far, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, all right, four questions. Uh, law, year of the first law providing for public education in what's now the U.S.? Anybody have a good guess? Good guess. Not right, but a good one. 1600s. You got to go back to the 16, late 1640s. Yes, ma'am. The old Deluder Satan Act of the 16th. There's actually three laws passed in Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 18, late 1840s. Those of you who've read the Crucible will remember why they had to pass the law. They had a problem in Massachusetts Bay Colony. They had a witch infestation, particularly in the Salem area. And the problem was that because people weren't literate, that old trickster Satan, the old deluder Satan, could trick them into becoming Satanists, and they would be evil, and that was bad for you know, the Massachusetts larger economy. And so what they needed to do was make sure the kids could learn to read so that they would read the Bible, so that they wouldn't get fooled by Satan, so that they wouldn't become witches. Um, for this, Massachusetts Bay Colony created a series of r laws requiring things like every town of 50 households had to sponsor a school. Um, hugely successful laws, by the way. Uh, those of you who hang out up there know that there's very few witches in Massachusetts Bay today. <laughs> in fact, it's little known, but if you go to your Massachusetts 11th grade history textbook, this is referred to as the No Witch Left Behind Act. But one of the key things to keep in mind is we have been doing formal education in the continental, what's now the continental United States, for going on four centuries. And the mission of that formative experience, or the common school launch in the 1830s and 1840s, when Horace Mann was deeply worried about all of these Catholics coming from Ireland and Southern Europe and Eastern Europe and wanted to make sure they would be Americanized by reading the King James Bible. The mission of schooling was never about meeting every child in a hugely diverse nation where they were. It was never about preparing every kid for college or career. It was never about making sure that every kid could master STEM or develop their gifts in the arts. That's not what our schools were built to do. Second question, 1810, what percentage of teachers were women? Anybody have a guess? About 10%. Back in the colonial era, it was thought to be inappropriate for women to interact with other people's kids outside the home. Um, the only kind of teaching that women really did in the colonial era from, say, 1775 to, like, 1825 was what was called a dame's school, which was basically an at-home pre-K, as we think about it today. Teaching was done by men, but this wasn't something that a man was going to do for a profession. It was something that second or third sons who hadn't gotten the family business or the farm did for a year here and a year there while they moved out to get a piece of land. This meant that it was hard to get a stable force of teachers, and it meant that you had to pay what men were going for, which was, you know, real money. Well, in the 1830s, I mentioned this dude, Horace Mann, who was deeply concerned about all these Catholics moving into his neck of the woods, and he wanted to set up schools that would decatholicize these Catholics. Now, the problem was, to launch these common schools, you needed a lot of labor, a predictable labor that would stay in place. So what they said was, aha, turns out it is going to be okay for women to teach, but only if they're trained how to teach by men, because they got to learn how to interact with the kids outside the home. So they set up special schools to teach women the norms of how to interact with kids. They were called normal schools. This is why all of today's teachers' colleges 
have normal schools somewhere in their history. They started as these schools. And these became the places where men trained women how to teach. By the late, seven, by the late 1800s, by 1870, teaching was a feminine profession. It was 75% female. Now, one of the big perks of this, from Horace Mann's perspective, was one, women weren't allowed to do other employment, so he didn't have to worry about talented teachers doing something else. And second, they couldn't do anything else, so you could pay them poorly. So they only had to pay half or a third what they would have had to pay similar men. By the way, when we think about all of the fights we have in schooling today about tenure laws and step and lane pay scales, those were introduced in the 1890s and the 1900s as a response to these insane policies that went back to the 1830s. The reason we have step and lane pay scales was a century ago, women teachers were still being paid half of what men teachers were, and black teachers half of what white teachers were, if that. So, if I was doing this stuff back in 1922, I would have probably been for these pay scales. I would have been for the tenure laws. It's not that they were bad ideas then, it's that they don't make sense today because the world changes. By the way, this model of staffing schools worked great from about 1840 to about 1960. Starting in 1960, other doors started to open up to talented women in America. In the 1950s, 55% of women who college aid, graduated college became teachers. Today, it's 15%. But if you hang out with the HR department at your local school district, they're still recruiting teachers today like they did in the 1950s. They still go to campus, and their pitch is, come work for us, and you can do the same job in 2053 that you're going to start doing with us next year. <laughs> Somehow it doesn't work, doesn't work with you know, Gen Z. Who, who would have thought? Question three. Oh, and by the way, we worry a lot about teacher turnover. Back in the 1960s, average college grad was going to hold three, four jobs before they retired. Anybody have any ideas how many jobs a typical college grad has today by the age of 30? A lot. <laughs> it depends on your time. So one of the problems is when we talk about the traditional teaching profession, we wind up in these for or against debates. Are you beating up on teachers? Are you defending? I'm like, it was a perfectly good model when the world worked that way but the world doesn't work that way and we're still trying to cram in a model. And it turns out it's extraordinarily hard to either get good people in classrooms now or to keep them because it just doesn't fit the lives, the lives that Americans live. Question three. Um, in 1900, what percentage of 18 year olds finished high school, graduate high school? About 6%, 6%. So you'll hear a lot today that our schools have gotten worse. There's no evidence of that. If you take the one out of 17 most accomplished graduates in your state, I suspect they would actually look at least as good as your typical high school graduating lineup from 1900. But what's happened is the scope of what we're asking schools to do has changed immensely. In 1900, you didn't need a high school degree. Hell, you didn't need to finish sixth grade. 80% of jobs were farms and factories. Today, 80% of jobs are linked in some way to the knowledge economy. So if you want to be an engaged citizen, if you want to have a productive life, education matters in a very different way than it used to. Oh, and by the way, sometimes if you go online, you'll find these uh, uh, graphics showing that like in 1930, US was number one in science, reading, and math. That's what we call fake news. Uh, there was no reputable or systemic international assessment of reading, math, or science until the 1990s when we get Tim's and Pisa. So when people claim to know how good American schools used to be, for good or bad, they're just making stuff up. Question four, 1990s. What percentage of schools were hooked on the internet? Zero, right? I remember when I was starting my PhD in 92, universities were bragging that they had this thing where you could send electronic mail to other professors around the country. This was a big selling point. They hadn't even shortened it to email yet. You felt they would have started with that. Um, so yeah, right? Think about if the pandemic hits in 1990. You know, when I was teaching high school back in that era, if you wanted to tutor a kid, you had two options. You could pick up like your yellow phone off your kitchen wall and like talk to them, or you could drive somewhere. The tools at our disposal for sharing knowledge, for teaching, for tutoring today are fundamentally unlike they were even 30 years ago. Look, what's, what's the upshot of all this? The upshot is that what we want schools to do has changed. Our expectations for kids have changed. The talent that does this in schools has changed. And the tools have changed. We call what we're dealing with schools, and we talk about school reform today, the mission 
what we're asking these places to do is fundamentally unlike what they were supposed to do or how they did it a century or two centuries ago. Now look, if you went in a time machine and you went back to like, I don't know, the 1800s and you found one of these leech dudes um, who would hang leeches on you know, your nose when you were sick, uh, you called him a doctor. But if you brought him into like 2022, I don't think any of you would, give the, would let him anywhere near an operating room where one of your kids had, you know, had a face surgery. You call him a doctor then, but it doesn't mean he is a doctor today. What we called schools then isn't what we necessarily want schools to do today, but we get thrown off by this label. Now, it's, this is a really, it's not a unique problem, but it's especially bad in education for a real simple reason. How do we deal with this in like the private economy? How does like TWA or Pan Am become JetBlue? How does General Motors become Tesla? How do like, they don't. Lots of the time, these guys go bankrupt. They go out of business. There is no Pan Am. There is no TWA. There is a General Motors, but that's because we gave it a ton of money in 2008. Um, <laughs> the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 company from birth to death is about 50 years. The vast majority of America's big organizations, big companies, have been launched since 1970. But in schooling, what's happened is we've got schools and school districts that were launched or incorporated in the 1950s, in the 1910s, and in some of your uh, communities, I suspect, the 19th century. And we expect leaders in these systems, school boards and superintendents and principals, to figure out through force of will how to take old contracts, staffing routines, regulations, rules, funding requirements, stipulate, and all the rest, and just magically kind of professionally develop their way around it. It is an unreally, unreasonable and unrealistic ask. What do we do differently? Well, for me, and this is why I'm so excited to be with you guys today, because this is where I think your role is so immense, is what we need to do is we need to think our way out of this. We spend a lot of time arguing about policy, because policy matters, and policy's constraining, but policy change to do what? We spent decades fighting about charter school laws <laughs> in order to launch charter schools, which 90% of the time use the same school day, the same staffing model, the same compensation schedule, the same school calendar as nearby district schools. I love charter schools. I'm in favor of charter schools. But the idea that this is what the whole battle was about seems to miss the point. Again, it's fighting about policy and it's fighting about sound bites rather than fighting about the vision for kids. What do I have in mind? I don't know. I mean, think about this. You know, we talk a lot about the excitement of the flipped classroom today. You know, and that's because not too long ago, somebody figured out the technology that allowed us to flip the classroom. His name was Gutenberg, and he did it five centuries ago. And five centuries is not that long a time. And before Gutenberg, what you had to do, of course, if you wanted to learn from, like, Socrates, is you had to haul your butt all the way over to Greece, and then you had to sit there within voice distance, because he didn't have a mic, and so you had to sit on a close enough log that you could hear Socrates talk at you. Um, otherwise, you could have learned from him. And then this dude came up with this book idea. And suddenly, you could be Abe Lincoln living, living on the prairie, and by candlelight, you could read Shakespeare. Totally change the world. Except, five centuries later, how many of you have gone into classrooms where teachers tell kids to read something the night before, and then make them read it out loud, paragraph by paragraph, while they're all sitting there? This misses the whole point of flipping the classroom. So the technology, the tools, in and of itself is not important. We used to build schools for, to solve a really simple problem. We only had so many books. We only had so many educated people. The real challenge we had to solve for in higher education or K-12 was getting educators and books together in one place with students. So we built these buildings, and we put everybody on transport, and we packed them together. Cool. When Abe Lincoln signed the land, College Land Grant Act in the 1860s, this was what we needed to solve for. It's not the problem we're trying to solve for today. It turns out every one of you guys is carrying in his pocket a little device that has more books than the best library in the world had 50 years ago. We have more educated people with more expertise to share in the United States and around the globe than you could have imagined 50 years ago and all of it available at the click of a button. And you can get tutors talking about neuropsychology with graphics and exciting little illustrations for 11 bucks an hour. 
slows the mind to contemplate. This means that what schools do, how they do it, we have tools at our disposal that were unimaginable to people talking about school reform even when Nation at Rick was Risk was launched. But how do we think about improving teacher quality today? We talk about giving everybody 7% more money. We talk about adding more requirements that people have to jump through before they're allowed to stand in a classroom. We talk about seeing if we can look at reading and math scores to evaluate whether somebody is good at teaching chemistry or French. We have a series of conversations which are about what we're used to talking about rather than what we're trying to do for kids. Look, now one of the really interesting things if we start to think this way, we start to say, what are we trying to build? How do we make it easier for kids to access math instruction that connects with them? How do we make it possible for families to make sure their kids are getting exposure to the values they hold dear? Or learning Mandarin rather than French from the long-term sub that the district... The mic's off. Oh, the mic's off? Yep. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll speak louder. Okay. Um, <laughs> how, how do we deal with this? Well, one of the opportunities here is that we have talked about school choice in a way that I think has been largely self-limited for the past 30 years. We have talked about school choice as a means for people who don't like their kid's school to get their kid into another school. Got news for you, which I think all of you know, which is that 75% of American parents like their kid's school. They give it an A or a B when you ask them, how would you grade your kid's school? Turns out that only about one in six or one in eight parents would like to change schools. Why? Because most families thought about this when they bought their house. They're invested in that school. Or they send their kid to a private school. Or they've already baked this in. So the political coalition for school choice has historically been the one parent out of eight who is most frustrated, which by the way means they re usually have the le fewest resources, which means they have the least impact on the political debate, and they're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with all of those homeowners who are worried about school choice, who don't have kids, but don't want to see their property values sink because they paid for access in this neighborhood, and now suddenly anybody else can send their kid in, and they're going to lose 65000 bucks off their property value. So we have made the school choice fight tough. And yet, because of the obvious <laughs> morality and sense of it, school choice has still made steady gains. But when we think about options, when we think about opportunities, when we think about rethinking, suddenly we're saying, you know what? 70% of parents like their kid's school, but if you ask them, do you like the kid's math program? Do you like the reading program? It turns out that numbers plunge into the 30s. Lots of parents have something they could change. They don't want to pull their kid out of school. How do we start to think about a world of options where people get to send their kid to a school but still tap into other experiences, other problem solving? Paul DePern is here. I think I saw Paul talking about it in his panel last, uh, an, you know, an hour ago. The vast majority of parents, 65% give or take, say they would like to have their kid at home at least one day a week right now coming out of pandemic. Turns out they actually like seeing what kids are doing. They like keeping an eye on the classroom. They like the interaction. I know I did. How do we think about changing those laws about what schools can do in terms of students participating on varsity teams and in terms of permissible calendars and days of attendance? So how do we talk about the changes that enable hybrid schooling and micro schooling in a way that is a much broader coalition? Of course you ought to have school choice if your school doesn't work for you, of course. But you also ought to have the option to get other courses and other support systems and other modes of attendance. And how do we think about all of this as not in terms of some vague abstract notion like equity, which I have yet in the last decade to find somebody who can actually tell me what the hell this means in a way that I understand it, but how do we talk about it in terms of all of these different parents with children with different needs are trying to find out a way to get their kids what they need today. And how do we make that much easier for all of these different kinds of families? By the way, the interesting thing here is this also broadens the coalition and how do we think about the interaction with teachers? Because lots of teachers 
no matter how many times we say school choice isn't about beating up on them, feel like school choice is about beating up on them. But there's also lots of teachers who've been frustrated about trying to launch programs. Lots of teachers who feel like their own creativity and their own problem solving has been stymied and stifled. Lots of teachers, you know, when I talk about Julie Squire, who's in here somewhere, Julie did this charter teacher paper for us. You know, when you talk about this, they're like, this sounds awesome. You're like, now you're talking about me like a professional. So when we open the aperture of what we're talking about, we start to invite in a lot more people to understand how this solves the real problems that they're wrestling with and isn't just something that advocates fight about in state capitals or Washington, D.C. Look, at the end of the day, let me stop with this, and then we can chat about it a bit if useful. But for me, I was excited when Eric asked me to come on out here because for me, a hybrid schooling, things like hybrid schooling and, uh, and, and micro schooling and course choice and education savings accounts, accounts are, are, are so, so powerful at this moment because they're a means and they're an end. If that end is not this is today's magnet schools or free schools, but the end is a vision of schooling where we give every kid, every family, every teacher this much more freedom to create the schools that are going to meet their needs in this century. Hey, thanks so much for letting me talk at you today. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Rick. Mike Donnelly, HSLDA. Equity is when everybody has the same outcome, regardless of their circumstances. Just Google it. <laughs> right, the so, boxes, the boxes. In there. Yeah, everything's the same on the, uh, on the output. And regardless of the input, okay, that's equity. Uh, anyway, um, is this all about funding? Are we just talking about how we spend the money that's available? One of the concerns I have when we talk about school choice is we're like, school choice, in my opinion, should not be you know, where we equate freedom and funding together. So can you just comment a little bit about that? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. So um, I think it's not just about funding uh, for a couple of reasons. One is one of the things you see, for instance, if you look at how they do school choice in Europe, where we talk a lot about, you know, there's expansive school choice, there are extraordinary restrictions on the private schools to take these dollars. So if part of the purpose is that we want to have room to think creatively about, wait a minute, if you're in a community that's rich with military vets who are looking for a second career, they don't necessarily want to become teachers. But survey results suggest a lot of them would like to teach. They'd like to mentor or tutor. Now, the problem is, if you're just talking about money following the kid, that does nothing to reduce the barriers that lets us start to tap these kinds of folks and let them be the role models and support systems for kids that they can be. If you're talking just about funding, and you've got uh, teacher of record requirements in state statute, or you've got seat time requirements baked in the state code, the funding doesn't give you any flexibility around those. So I think the I think giving people the freedom to have those dollars back, back of course, I mean, I, you know, many of us have been all like, woo -hoo, on this for a couple decades now. Uh, but I think if you do that, and you're only intent on that, you wind up, you know, creating a very different outcome in your hope. So I'm just wondering, I've got a lot of boys, I'm just wondering, um, do you have any examples of these types of programs that put the child first that are, you know, what does the student need or in aggregate, what do these students need that we could look at as an example? Uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous question. I'll say whatever I say to, to reporters whenever they were like, who's the, who, who, which superintendents are getting this right? And I'll always say like, you know, I'm the last guy in the world to speak to this. I hang out in a DC, you know, in my shingles in a DC office building. What I know about school models or what I, is mostly what somebody has sold me on when they come out uh, for lunch, uh, you know, in, in, up there. And, you know, the number of these things I've actually walked through and seen with my own eyes is frighteningly small because where I sit. So I'm the last person to ask for this. What I will say is I think it's, I think we have a bad habit of thinking about, um, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the sinners and sin thing. We were about Catholicism a moment ago. McShane, wherever you are, I hope you're loving this. Uh, uh, the, uh, I think one of the things we do is we, the school reformers were hugely guilty of this, say from no child left behind through race to the top era, is they would find the reformers and they would say, do what they're doing. 
And so whatever Michelle Reed or Joel Klein or somebody was doing became like what you're supposed to do. And for me, what I think we want to do, and also that meant we didn't pay a lot of attention to details of how it worked. Like, well, they're, they seem to be getting good results, and they're, and they're doing this DC impact evaluation system in, in DC, so just do that. But what it means to do that is really complicated, because what was that? And one of the things I worry about is when we talk about models, we tend to look at some place that is having some degree of measurable success, and we go, let's replicate it. But it's not clear whether they're being successful because they had a lot of buy-in on the front end, because they had a memorandum of understanding, understanding that gave them the flexibility to do it, because when they went around the country asking who was right for this, they happened to be the right fit in terms of the student population and kind of what the solution was offering, because they were getting a ton of tender loving care, uh, foundation funded TLC from whoever dreamed up this model. So for me, I'm much less interested in like who's getting it right and more in the things that seem to have promise for what you're trying to do for your kids. And that's a hard lesson for us to, it, you know, it's hard for a lot of, especially like the big advocacy groups and the foundations and they want to know what to get behind, what state, what district model that they can run people through on the dog and pony show. But I actually think we wind up spending a lot of time and effort um, and not getting a lot of traction because, because of this. Yes. So if you had um, to list three things necessary for any model to work, what would those be? Uh, that's such a great question. I think for me, the first is time. Uh, the most important thing we do in school is we have time with kids. Uh, you know, typical state, something like 1,100 hours a year. Now, here's one of the things. You, you hear all the time about how we need to extend the school year to catch up with, like, Western Europe and Japan. Uh, if you go to the OECD data on this, you will see that American kids actually spend more hours in school per year than the OECD norm. Our kids spend more hours in school per year than the OECD norm. But then there's this question, what are we doing with this time? And the last actual time diary study of what kids are doing in classrooms in the US was conducted in 2003. We have horrific data on this. Matt Kraft at Brown University did a terrific study in Providence, Rhode Island last year, uh, in which he found that the average uh, classroom is interrupted 2,000 times a year, costing the average kid something like 15 to 20 learning days. I can't think of anything less respectful to children and teachers than having them sit in schools for 20 days a year when nothing is happening because we're making announcements because we can't keep visitors from disrupting class because of all the kinds of stuff that Matt detailed. So that's the first thing. Second thing is I think we need to get much more purposeful about how we use talent. Look, if you can fill up a school with phenomenal teachers who can lecture powerfully and put a hand on a shoulder powerfully and do a great job watching kids eat lunch and do all of this, and you've got that many phenomenal teachers in your building that you're not worried about it, then God bless, the current model probably works fine. But in my experience, every training I do with like principals and superintendents, there is an endless wine fest about how hard it is to find enough teachers. We can't find enough spe good special ed teachers. We can't, all right, why are your special ed teachers spend 40% of their time doing paperwork? What is it that your teachers do all day and which of these things make a difference in kids' lives and which don't? And how do you reallocate those responsibilities? And how are you paying phenomenal early literacy teachers in a way that keeps them around? Because not anybody can do a good job diagnosing and intervening to build phonemic awareness. And how are you thinking about that differently from people who do other stuff? So thinking differently about roles and responsibilities and how we use talent. And then the third thing is the power of technology. Uh, you know, I, I think the last two years were horrific for all of the ed tech sleazebags. You know, they were all so excited. I remember, I, couldn't, I cannot tell you, because of my Forbes column mostly, and I'm sure McShane is the same problem, how many pitches I got from like PR flax for EdTech in like 2020. Oh, this is gonna be showing how wonderful our product is. No, no, it turns out Zoom in a room doesn't impress anybody. Uh, but uh, the thing is, technology is really powerful when used properly. Uh, for me, my favorite example is go to like a really well-run high school football practice, and you will see a coach uh, you know, whoever's assistant coach with like the quarterbacks will sit down with the quarterbacks and instead of doing this like back in my day when they had to have a chalkboard and they had to draw the play and draw sloppy arrows and then you would watch some tape, grainy tape, 
And then they would do this and erase it. Instead, they can pre-pack 20 or 30 plays on the iPad with like the graphics, and they'll talk the kids through it, go out, do it. They can film the kids on the iPad while they're running it, and then go back and do it. How often do we actually see folks thinking about English language instruction through that lens? Chemistry, how often are we actually bringing that in when we talk to kids about presentation style? My second grader just did his states project. You know, I was like, hey, the teacher gave, you know, teacher gave him feedback on his presentation style. Did you see your presentation style? No, like, right, why not? Why aren't we taping the kid and then the teacher's talking about the kid one-on-one -on -one and saying, here's what you did that was really good. And here's, here's what I mean when I say you did that. So the tools that we have at our disposal should let us think in fundamentally different ways about the work of instruction, but the number of even schools that I get billed as to be as innovative that actually have done this in a way that like, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're blowing my mind. Not so many. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for everything that you've said. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about, there was a question over here about, you know, the, uh, you know, where you see the outcomes for children, et cetera. And one of the things I've just like, since being here this morning, I hear two different um, emphases. Some people are talking about what families and parents want, and other people are talking about what kids want. And I'm, I'm not trying to say this or that, but while we're talking about where do we want all of this to go, I have not previously thought about, I, I thought that was one and the same, but I'm hearing that these actually could be two different things. So in all this policy making and, and, and whatever it is we're looking at, maybe we also need to be clear about are we putting the child first or are we putting the parents first? And I'm not arguing in favor of either, but those are two very different things in my mind. That's a wonderful point. And, you know, and it's funny because like a lot of this stuff gets conflated. Um, and you know, if you go, you know, right historically, like you know, in the Republic when Plato was writing about this stuff, right? It's the, the parent, the child, and the state. And part of this is this relationship because we also often think about the state as the agent for the child against the parent. So many of the most ardent critics of homeschooling say, well, you know we're worried that parents aren't gonna do right, so the state has to step in. And then like, I guess, you know, this comes down to how much faith you have in people who work for state education agencies. It's like the, the arbiters of, um, and, uh, but th that's exactly right, it's important to, you know, another wrinkle on this, I'll say, is I I've also been deeply concerned. I started out teaching in the last century, and I spent, you know, a lot of the 1990s training student teachers um, up in Massachusetts, uh, Boston, and, and Somerville and stuff. And one of the things that was frighteningly easy when I taught in Louisiana, or when I trained people in Boston, was it was no trick at all to find teachers who you'd say, of a student teacher, you'd say, teacher would say, uh, you know, Jim did real good. And I'd go, well, Jim, you did okay, but look to me like 12 kids were really locked in, and 15 kids were kind of tuned out for that whole part of the class. And I can't tell you how many times a teacher would say, yeah, but those 15 are the coconuts. They're never going to get engaged. And this was just something that got said in the teacher's lounge. You said it out loud. For me, the great victory of the No Child Left Behind era was that we said, no, you want to be a teacher? Your damn job is to figure out how to make sure every kid is learning. Like, you're not allowed to just say it ain't happening. What I worry about is that we've overcorrected, though. You know, now I feel, you know, the problem in the 90s was it was easy to say if a kid didn't learn, it's the parent's fault. Now I find that superintendents and school leaders are so terrified of saying to parents, you got to do your job, too. You know, if you take your kid to a pediatrician and the pediatrician says, you know, uh, says to me, Rick, uh, Gray's got to lose some weight. And I'm like, really, doc? Okay. And the doc's like, first thing, put away the Cheetos. And I take Gray home, and first thing I do is let him turn on the TV and eat Cheetos. We don't say it's a bad doctor. We say that there's got to be a handshake here. The doctor has to do their job, and we weren't calling teachers to account in the 90s, but we have to be unafraid to say that there's a relationship here between family and school, and I think we've become terrified of saying this in the public sphere, and one of the things that I think um, I like about, again, some of the create, creation that's going on is the relationship in things like learning pods and micro schools and the rest it's an opportunity to try to reset that relationship between family and school as a partnership, that both sides have to come to that handshake and mean it. 
Um, and it's, that doesn't answer your, the point you raise, but I do think it's a wrinkle on that too. Yes, sir. I think we're all agree that individualized learning is the most important thing, right? But when we think about who are going to be the ultimate benefactors of that individualized learning, can you talk a little bit about what happens after Johnny and Susie graduates and how does their preparation prepare them for industry? We seem to not have that a part of this conversation of individualized learning. That's a great, and you know, and I think this is one of the places where the accountability push got off tracks uh, in the aughts, is that, you know, I'm a big believer in the fact that kids are in very different places and need different things. I also believe every kid ought to be literate and numerate. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the 17 state assessments required under the Every Student Succeeds Act, even though I was a bitter opponent of like the half-baked, clumsy, no child behind accountability impositions. So, but I do think we need to know this, and there has to be an expectation that we can't say, oh, they'll look it up. No, if you're not literate, you ain't gonna look nothing up. Let's, let's, be, let's be real. Um, look, I think there's a couple things. One is we have sabotaged career and technical education in this country. Uh, we sabotaged it partly because a lot of the DSEG fights um, raised really good and important questions about how career technical ed was being used when it was voc ed, um, because it's shoddy and not taken and not treated as valuable. Also, frankly, the licensure requirements are a nightmare. If you're trying to get folks who can actually teach valuable skills like welding, and then your solution is you're going to make them get certified to be teacher of record instructors, that's lunacy. What the hell are we thinking about here? Uh, so there's a couple of states, I think, that have done really interesting stuff. One, if you haven't seen what Frank Edelbutt's done in New Hampshire with kind of Learn Everywhere, that the state board can now uh, empower uh, other entities to give instruction that maps state standards and then gets, uh, and, and then, and then, uh, gets credit. Uh, in Louisiana, uh, Cade Brumley's pushed this um, fast forward. They've created 39 new industry, um, industry partnership certifications. Kids can finish 12th grade, walk right into a $55,000 a year job in something like aerospace engineering in certain parishes in Louisiana where that partnership exists. So one, I think we need to think about that. That's got to be integrated. And again, it's hard to do it if you're running a school that's been through the high school fights of the last 65 years, which is one of the ways that what you guys are doing can start to open up some of the doors on this. The other piece is I think we have to change the law around, um, it, it, I, I think it should be uh, illegal um, under any fair-minded reading of the 64 Civil Rights Act uh, for employers to require college degrees uh, for any job where it does not specifically apply uh, to the core work. Um, in 1973, in uh, Duke versus Griggs, um, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that you could not use hiring tests, uh, which had a discriminatory, imp a discriminatory, <laughs> a discriminatory impact and were not directly related to the embedded work. The Chief Justice, Warren Berger, had a riff in that, and what she said, well, you know, we're not talking about college degrees today, but the same logic has to apply. We can't let employers acquire degrees, especially when we know that degrees bake in all kinds of massive inequalities about who's getting degrees in terms of socioeconomic class and race and the rest. But what happens is we have pushed high schools to send kids to college because there's lots of jobs, especially management track jobs, that if you don't have a college degree, you're at a massive disadvantage in terms of getting hired or you're not even going to be considered through like an online uh, resume collector. And that winds up distorting what, why people go to college, which distorts what we're expecting high schools prepare them for, which distorts all of this. So part of what we need to do is make it safe for people to go ahead and get trained and build up skills and then go to college if they want to go to college, but not feel like they're being held hostage to go to college.